Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is a joy for all of us to uh, welcome you here to the Lafayette Avenue Presbyterian Church. Uh, we like to say around here we are a diverse community of faith where people of faith or no faith at all can come and experience the divine through openness and honesty, music, um, and of course the arts as well. Um, I was um, raised uh, correctly, so I just want to make sure that I say thank you to a few folks who made this day possible. Uh, first is a woman that you heard from, which is Deb Howard. Can you please give her a round of applause? Uh, events like these don't come together if there are not a lot of folks behind the scenes making it all come together. Deb is definitely one of those people. I want to thank our partners at the Pratt Institute. We have some students who uh, are here at the church. Um, Pratt is uh, making their resources available to make sure that this uh, afternoon is recorded. So um, if you're part of the Pratt Institute, just know that we say thank you as well. Thank you so much. You might be wondering, how did this afternoon come together? At least I would be wondering how it happened. Um, we have um, a member of the church, Clifton Williams, who's here. Clifton, can you just raise your hand? He's in the back there. Um, Clifton uh, was here one day, um, and um, Hank Pressing um, uh, had some family members that walked in that wanted to see the mural. Um, and uh, Clifton, uh, being the genius that he is, uh, got Hank's contact info. Um, and a few weeks later, on a phone call, Hank Prussy walked Clifton and I over the phone through each of the panels of this mural from memory. I don't know where you were, you know, Hank, if you were on your couch or something, but um, he, um, with clarity and um, incredible precision, was able to uh, remember things that people were wearing and facial expressions and able to tie this entire uh, mural together. Um, and on, you know, on the spot, Clifton and I just thought, uh, there's no way that we should have that experience ourselves without offering up for the whole community as well. So, um, you know, asked Frank at the end of that call if he would be willing to make the trip here, um, and he said that he would, um, and that is what brings us here together. Um, so you can consider this um, uh, my debut as a talk show host, if you will. Uh, Conversations on the Avenue. Um, um, and we have um, an amazing guest, uh, Hank Prussing. Um, he graduated from Pratt Institute uh, with a Bachelor's of Fine Arts and a Bachelor's of Architecture. Um, has um, over 35 murals uh, that he did here in the New York City area, plenty more outside of the New York City area. Uh, and this just happens to be uh, one of the remaining uh, murals uh, that are still around. So we are just so lucky to have him here. We're gonna have uh, a conversation about his time here at the church, his time at Pratt, and then get into the conversation about the mural. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Hank Preston. Thank you. Uh, I think I turned it on. Yeah, I can hear myself. Awesome, awesome. And Mr. Prosty, I just want to thank you uh, for, for, for taking the time to, to be here, um, especially because you have such a rich connection to the neighborhood and also to this church as well. I uh, would love if you would just um, let us know a little bit about who you are as a person um, and perhaps some of those foundational experiences perhaps of uh, things that you've been through that have led you to this career uh, as an artist and as an architect. Okay, I'll try. Uh, actually, I, I, my connection with the church came before my connection with Pratt Institute. I came up here as a high school student from Bethesda, Maryland and painted a mural, two murals in the summertime of uh, 1965, I think it was. Um, and uh, I was part of a summer youth program where students from other, co from colleges in the South came up to work with uh, children in, in the neighborhood. And there were a number of projects like that over a period of time. And this was one of, one of the summers uh, that, that it happened. And 
I was just having to be there at the same time and painted these two murals. And I got interested in Pratt Institute at the time. So I decided to come to school here. So this was my first connection with the neighborhood. I painted a mural uh, that's no longer there on, in the uh, vestibule of the church. The, the, right between those two center doors, there's an archway. And inside of that, it's just plain, painted dark now. I didn't care much I for the mural, so uh, you know. I didn't care too much for the mural, and it was painted over after a while. But uh, anyway, that's, that was my first mural here. And I also painted one which still exists uh, above the entrance between the Jarvie room and the, and the gymnasium. They used to call the gymnasium in the back there. Um, so that, that's still there. It's Jesus healing the blind man, I remember. But that was years before this happened. And uh, I, I, like I said, I came to Pratt. I had painted murals in a church in Washington, D.C. Uh, before that. And uh, I painted a few murals after that. And uh, when I graduated from the architectural school, I was hired to paint, to paint these. So mm -hmm. that's kind of it. Yeah. You know, one of the things that um, you know, was really interesting is I heard you talk about how we got to the mural is that it was your participation in the life of the church and some other um, architectural kind of reconfigurations that kind of sparked the idea for this mural um, to, to even come about. So could you tell us a little bit about perhaps what the church was like at that time <clears throat> and then talk about the architectural reconfiguration uh, that kind of laid the foundations for this mural? Sure. Um, back in the early, mid-1970s, uh, I don't think the congregation was nearly as large as it is now. And, uh, and there was a sense that uh, people were in this space that was designed for another era and another time. And it was. Uh, and anyway, the congregation was small and it felt like they were lost in a large, kind of vast, empty space, except for the incredible art glass windows up there. But uh, between the windows, it was just blank wall. And uh, it was felt that something needed to be done to make the space not only more um, warm and hospitable to people that were, if they were especially in a smaller group, but also to make it more adaptable and accessible for uh, activities uh, that happen up here in the chancel area uh, and other activities outside of religious activities. This church was built around 1860, and I think it was designed for the first pastor, Theodore Ledger Kyler, who I believe was a a very charismatic orator. And uh, he attracted lots of people. And this is what people did on their day off in the mid-19th century. They came to church and heard a great preacher. And they built this church for him. I think there were originally 22, 2300 seats in the pews here in this space. And they were still there in 1975. Um, there, were, there were plenty of pews here now, but there are more pews that came up almost uh, to, the, to the pulpit. There was enough room for the uh, communion table, a couple of chairs, and the baptistry, and that was about it. And uh, so in the more modern era, people wanted to be, have a more participatory religious experience and do things in the front of the church, and we didn't have space. So uh, anyway, they, did, they realized that things had to be done to make it, to adapt the space. And recently, having graduated from architecture school, I was brought in to help the church think through a possible um, renovation of the, of the sanctuary. And then, uh, uh, so we changed the, the, Kyler was a great orator, but he was physically a, quite a short person. And the, the, the uh, pulpit used to be very high, so he would appear large and could speak <laughs> out to people. And so it was up several steps, and uh, that alcove wasn't there. Um, there was a panel in front with an inscription on it, and he was sort of, pushed forward and, uh, and spoke down, and down at the people. And this was not really the style back in the 1970s. It was in the 1860s. So, and also behind him, the, the uh, organ console was up in the balcony and the choir sat up there. And so people were, like we were speaking about earlier, people were looking forward. It was a, an experience where uh, you know, the, the preacher and the musicians were were giving a performance and people were listening to it. It wasn't that much of a participatory experience. And we wanted to change that. So anyway, we went through that process. 
and changed things in the chancel area and brought the organ down and so on and made uh, these you know, movable sections of the uh, risers so that people could do different things here. In the meantime, we looked up just a few years earlier, the fire marshal had closed the stairs to the balcony because they were uh, trap, fire traps and uh, people were not allowed to use the balcony anymore. In the meantime, we had lots of pews up there and it even felt more like uh, there were few people here when you had all those empty seats up in the balcony. And it was decided at the time the church wanted to at least take the pews out and try to do something to make it more comfortable for people in the smaller groups here. So that's, that's where the idea of a mural started. And I proposed the idea of it, not realizing that they had already thought about it and, and talked to another artist about it before, uh, who was happened to be one of my uh, teachers at Pratt Institute. <laughs> I don't know why, but that didn't work. They, uh, negotiations stopped with that person. What grade did you get in that class? <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we, we, uh, I brought up the idea, they said, it's strange, we, we just went through that process and uh, I proposed something and they liked the idea. And then I heard that, um, again, I'm sorry, I'm going back a little bit in time, but originally when this church was first built, these art glass windows were not here. They were, there were windows, stained glass windows there, but they were uh, more of a geometrical pattern. We still have some if you go outside and look at the at the tower in the corner on the outside, you'll see the kind of windows that used to be in here. They were, didn't have depictions of biblical scenes. They were just geometric designs. They were lovely, but it was kind of done in um, Dr. Kyler's more st severe Scottish approach to, to design. And, uh, and when he, his pastor had ended, uh, David Gregg was the second pastor of the church. He came on board. He had a little different idea of how incorporating the arts into the, into the sanctuary, and, and, and he hired the Tiffany Company to come and do a master plan, and uh, that's where the idea that windows, these windows came up. They were done one by one as the church could afford them, uh, but the Tiffany did the overall design, and he also designed a, a kind of series of uh, stenciled and uh, detailed and gilded wall areas between to kind of unify the windows. And, this is, goes back to a, a large, long tradition of small groups and large buildings going back to almost to the beginning of Christianity. And it wasn't big empty spaces though, where people that, when you looked up at the walls, you saw the windows, but you also saw murals. You might have, in a cathedral, you might have seen sculptures. Mm -hmm. uh, you might have seen uh, beautiful architectural details and uh, you know, vaulted areas and columns and so on. Anyway, uh, that's what you meant to, so that when the minister saw people looking up at the, at the walls during a sermon, he wouldn't necessarily think they were daydreaming, that they'd be <laughs> looking uh, and getting uh, inspiration, right? Mm -hmm. From the religious iconography oh, up doing. there. That's what they're doing. Yeah, that's what they're doing <laughs> up there. So, um, so anyway, we, we had that originally in the church, well, not with Kyler, but with David Gregg when he brought the Tiffany Company in. And, uh, those stencil wall areas were up until 1917, I believe. And then for some reason, the minister at that time had a more Scottish strict approach <laughs> again, and they went back to wanting just blank walls. But there was a woman in the church at the time who was raised that loved those uh, decorative designs up there, and she liked seeing the church kind of warmer. And, uh, and uh, her name was Elise Stutzer, and, and she had actually left money in her will. Uh, if the church ever was wanted to reanimate, redecorate those wall spaces between, um, then her money would go towards that effort, and that's that's what allowed the church to 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 uh, fund the mural project itself. So anyway, uh, at that point, I was uh, kind of brought on board, not as an architect anymore, but I changed I changed uh, my function there. I switched hats. I took off my architect's cap and I put on my artist beret, right? <laughs> I should have brought that tattered old beret as a prop. <laughs> I would have made me more photogenic. Uh, so uh, anyway, I didn't. And uh, so I started thinking of this room as an artist. And, uh, and if you want, we can get into that. Unless you have a few more questions, I can get into to how the mural concept came out of uh, me looking at the wall as an artist. Yeah, no, that was going to be my next question, so go ahead. <laughs> okay. 
That was easy. Um, <laughs> a mural painter, does, it's, it's, it's not like a, a, a painting on canvas. You know, you don't necessarily think about when you design a mural, you don't think about what you're going to paint on the wall. You think about what you can draw out of the wall. In other words, what inherent um, characteristics the wall might have that you can enhance with a mural. And so that's what I did. I started looking. And uh, the first thing I noticed was this wall surface I was going to paint on was actually one wall surface going all the way around the church. It only began and ended with the organ pipes. Those are the only corners. The rest of it's round. The ceilings are even chamfered. But, and it, it opens up in the back, sure, but, but the mural is it's like a ribbon that stretches around the room. So that got me, gave me the idea there might be a, a cyclical uh, concept that we could use. And uh, uh, so uh, and the, the organ itself is the only thing up there that's uh, different from a visual delight. It's, I mean, it is visually delighting thing, the organ case, but it, it obviously, you think of sound when you see the organ pipes. Everything else is visual. So that seems to be a good place to begin and end a visual trip around the room. So that, that was the front and center, mm -hmm. which it is anyway in the church. Right. And that is the part of the uh, wall that opens up. That's, that's the only set of windows in the back there, which isn't on this strip. It's not, this wall doesn't punctuate with, with the windows. And, and it's the only window that doesn't have Jesus Christ in it, I believe. Uh, it has uh, St. Paul preaching on Mars Hill in Athens. And it has some apostles on either side. I'm not sure who those are, I forget. I think it's Moses on the left, and I forget who was on the right side. But anyway, so I took that as the midpoint of a cycle. Right. And then I started looking. Maybe I better get up at this point. I'm going to go around like this. And folks, um, if you are seated, seated in a position where you can't see uh, where Mr. Pressing is pointing to, um, we, we like to keep things family style around here. So feel free to get up and to position yourself so that you can see mm -hmm. what he's talking about. So if he started here, you all from this side, we'd like to come over and stand hey, up. Deb, do you want to just use a mic? You're welcome. Oh, okay. Watch out. So those of you on the left, <clears throat> my left, can come over and stand behind me and show you that you can see what he's pointing to. One more general observation before I get into the specific themes is that uh, in most spaces uh, you have windows in walls and the windows give you a sense of orientation as to where you are uh, in the outside world. Of course, in a church that has stained glass windows, it's kind of different because the windows don't look out. I mean, you get a sense of what time of day it is by wh where the light's coming in and if it's light or dark, you know, it's the day or night. Other than that, though, you don't know where you are, what direction you're facing. So the, these windows being depictions of the incident, biblical incidents, uh, point inward instead of outward. And so I decided maybe the mural should do the opposite and point outward and give you a sense of orientation into the community that the church is located. So uh, they kind of reverse their roles here. You've got the, uh, and yet they related in that the uh, themes of the windows, and I'll get into that, uh, are kind of enhanced by the attitudes and the states of mind that you can see in the characters around them. So this first window obviously is the, uh, the the birth of Christ, the nativity window, and that kind of leads you out of the organ, uh, which is the beginning of this cycle. And here people are kind of coming together. I call it gathering. You know what? I had other names too. This is, these are clouds. It's called clouds of witness or cloud of witnesses. And so I had names for each of these panels, but it's kind of an amorphous thing. I called, I called it uh, anticipation, this first one, but it can be convergence or gathering. If you notice, the people on the left side are further apart than the people on the right side. They're getting more congealed as you go to the right, and they're checking each other out. They're looking around. You have different kinds of people. You even have a bagpiper up there that I caught in the park. I don't know if he still plays there, but he used to come there on Sunday mornings. Yeah. 
and uh, they're all kind. There are a couple. Here's an interracial couple. There's a there's a gay couple over here. There's an elderly couple here. There's a postman. Uh, it's all about anticipation and delivery, uh, looking ahead. Here's a group of young children that are going over a fence. I caught them at the old Central uh, Prospect Park Zoo, actually, and they were they were trying to get across to the animals. <laughs> I hope they didn't ex succeed, but. But they, they were so curious, they wanted to go beyond where they were supposed to go. So that's, that's what I've caught here. And, uh, and so there are people checking each other out, but they're all drawn to the same thing, which is this nativity window. Uh, so anyway, that's the basic theme, all different kinds of people. And then the next window over is the baptism of Christ. And so it seemed to me the, a, a, a set of emotions or states of mind or uh, what did I call them? I called them attitudes, I think, originally, that people are expressing in each of these panels. The kind of attitude I would expect in here would be one of nurturing. I also called it uh, caring or supporting or protecting or holding. So everyone in here shows is, is in some way, look at, this is obvious where these two young Boys, he, his arm is even reached up as an arc going into the window to the left. And, and this large woman is holding her son or grandson here. And, and here's another child that's being held by his mother. And uh, they're watching, here's a family, they're watching the young child skip rope. And here's a grandmother watching her child. These are two friends just caring for each other. And these, these they're obviously a couple discussing something intimate. And it's just nurturing. That's all. And it seems to, be, to fit between these two panels. I mean, the idea is that the themes behind these biblical incidents, and they're not all biblical, some of them like, uh, may, may not be in, actually in the Bible, but they're all things that we think of when we think of Christianity. And uh, they all relate to Christ, but they elicit certain reactions in us. And people express those reactions in that anyway in the outside world, just on the streets. and so. I was trying to bring the outside to the inside and the secular to the sacred and all that together with this. So the next panel over is, is Jesus, the third one to the right, the next mural over, I'm sorry, the next window over is Jesus on the road to Emmaus. And he's talking with a couple of the disciples who don't, know, don't recognize him. Um, they just think he's a stranger that they met on their walk and this is after the crucifixion. I, I'm not sure what they're discussing, I forget, but but I think they're talking to him like they're talking to a stranger. And, and so uh, if, they, if they knew it was Christ, they'd talk to him in a different way, I'm sure. So anyway, this, this panel then, between the nurturing window uh, of, the, of the baptism and, and that next window over, I called friendship. It's just people relating to each other on a peer, peer basis. Um, so there's a group of kids here that are just hanging out together. There's some women that may be on a lunch break walking together. There's some girls that are hanging out together in a clique. There's a couple of business buddies together. There's some old ladies gossiping probably. <laughs> there's a man and his friend who's blind. They're talking. And they're just, they're just being, they're just, uh, I've also got companionship and geniality and goodwill and courtesy and sharing and affection. It's, you know, it's a cloud of, of attitudes that I'm trying to express here, but it seemed to be a cloud of attitudes that fit between those two windows. And the next one over is very different because the, uh, the last small window to the right there is Jesus as a 12-year-old boy uh, speaking with the Pharisees in the temple. And they're, they're amazed, he's telling them about their religion, they're supposed to know, but he's a child and he's telling them. And, uh, and so it's, it's like truth, truth speaking to power, like you spoke about this morning and, and, and about authority. And so this one on the left moves beyond people just being genial to each other and more towards uh, confrontation. So this panel, I think I called it, uh, assertion. I also said it could be called challenge or it's about friction, it's about contention, it's about uh, worry and, and apprehension, uneasiness, concern. 
So you see like there's a, a couple having an argument here and he wants to go that way and she's saying, well, maybe that's not the right way to go. Here's a man kind of barging through the middle of them. He doesn't care. Uh, and he's moving ahead. It's kind of an assertive type A personality. <laughs> there, there's a young girl telling her brother, her younger brother to stand up against his bully over here. And, uh, and I, think, I think there's a group of guys making a cat call with this woman. So, uh, so she's standing up to them. And there's a policeman who's just sort of there. I think he's picking his fingernails. But uh, he's, he's a kind of looking over it all and being an obvious sign of authority, but in the background. There's a man giving directions in the back. Uh, anyway, it's about authority and, uh, and asserting yourself. So to the right of that, th this, is, this gets interesting because here we're talking about, yeah, I don't know if you want to move. You could have, if, if people in the back want to come forward, you can come over to this so you can see the we're still looking. We're still looking on the left side, though, this back panel I haven't described yet. But at any rate, that back uh, window, which is really a triptych of windows, is again, it's St. Paul preaching on Mars Hill, and it's the only one, like I said, that doesn't have Jesus Christ in it. It's, a, it's like the next generation of Christianity. It's Christianity's uh, message out in, going out into the world in the beginning of the religion. And so it's like an extension. Here, we're, it's more intimate. You know, these windows depict a more intimate part of the Christian story, and then now you're out into the world. So um, there's a rush to get out, and, um, and there's obviously uh, martyrdom involved and, uh, and contention. And so again, they seem to be the next panel over from, from uh, assertion would be one that I called anxiety over here. And uh, let's see, what else did I say? Friction, tension, worry, uneasiness. So it's, it's similar, it's, it's kind of an extension of this one, but it's even more involved. You've got young children running through a group of people and probably calling, causing consternation because they're disrupting people. There's a guy here looking at his watch. He's, he's, uh, he's running out of time, so he's got anxiety. He's an older gentleman. Uh, either getting onto a bus or getting off of a bus, afraid that he's, he might fall and break his bones, so he's anxious for that reason. Here's some people, a, a couple rushing across the street, I think I caught them there, to do dodge a car probably. There are people that are suspicious or anxious about other people they're looking at across the way. Um, there are uh, people pushing their way through. There's a woman that just seems anxious. She's lighting her cigarette, I think and uh, your hair is kind of ruffled. There's a, there's a group of people here that are rushing to catch a, I think it was catch a bus. And anyway, so it's all about, they're all expressing anxiety in one way or another, at least the way I saw them. Again, these, these are based on photographs that I took around the neighborhood. I didn't really get into that. I looked at the windows and, and tried to understand their messages behind the stories. But I also went out and at the same time, and I think I took about 700 photographs just around the streets. And I just wanted, I didn't know what I wanted to do yet, but I, I, I just wanted to kind of document the neighborhood and what people did, how they behaved. Um, I'm just doing ordinary things, random things on the streets. And then I tried to put them together with the themes in them, in the window. So that's what these people are doing, and, and I might have seen things in them that uh, other people don't see, but that's the approach I used. So I guess we can move over to the other side now. I have one more general thing I'd like to say, which is that, you know, there are people in the windows, and I tried to kind of, uh, I mean, they're different sized people that I painted, but I tried to kind of balance them with the size of the people that were in the windows, and I also tried to uh, relate where I wanted to, the colors that were in the windows. Um, so I won't point out specifics, but you can check them out yourself. This next window over here is uh, the Road to Calvary, I think that's what the window is called, and it's Christ 
you know, collapsing. Uh, somebody's about, what's, I forget the name, Bar starts with a B, the guy that takes off the cross uh, and carries it for, for away. Uh, Bar it's not Barabbas, is it? It's not. No, I forget who it is. But uh, at any rate, uh, so he's at a low point, obviously, on his way up to Calvary, and he's lost his energy and uh, for temporarily. So this panel on the left of it, after this whole sequence of going out into the world where you see St. Paul in the back window, um, this is starting to be a contraction of, of this site along the cycle. We're heading back towards the front of the room now. And uh, I called that one neglect. And there are other words that I used, which is inattention and lethargy and floundering, or a loss of some sort, a loss of function or a loss of purpose loss of vitality, loss of direction, and uh, a withdrawal, uh, and maybe only a shell remaining of the person that's just depicted there. Uh, sometimes people ask me what this guy's doing here, and he's selling them, the old gentleman who's selling American flags, and he's got all kinds of patriotic buttons. If you, got, if you were able to look up there closely, you could read some of the buttons. It was geared to uh, the election of uh, 1974, I think. 72, 1972, the presidential election. There's actually a George Wallace sticker up there. So if you remember him. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I saw him as a sh kind of a shell of a person. I mean, he's obviously dressed up like Uncle Sam, uh, and he's outwardly expressing patriotism. But, but to me, he looked like he was a reactionary person, and he, all you saw was a shell of, of patriotism. He was actually hawking patriotism. So that, that's why he's doing there. And he's among these other people who seem to be down and out or just, they don't have much energy. They're looking, sitting. And uh, here's a man who's probably a wino. He probably has a bottle in that bag there. And there, there's another man who's having trouble walking. He's got his shirt off. Uh, there's a man who's, he must have been in a fight. He's got his arm in a, a, bra in a cast, I think. This, this man's having trouble walking here. He's uh, got arthritis or something. There's an old, old woman. I think this is a three-generation family here. And the little girl's getting away from the, her large, fairly large mother who probably has trouble catching up with her. And there's a man just sleeping. Going around the corner, I put him in the corner there because that was a good place where his body bent around. And uh, there's a, a, a girl here I was playing. I think she was, she's got a ball in her hand. I, I think she's forgotten where, to, what the game, where the game was or something like that. This, this kind of represents a missed opportunity here. <laughs> I'll leave that to you. And, uh, and I don't know, I forget some of these other ones. But uh, it all, in one way or another, those people, to me at the time anyway, uh, expressed some kind of neglect or collapse or withdrawal from life. So, which seemed appropriate with this window. The next window over starts going back towards hope. Is Jesus knocking at the door? Again, I'm not sure this was actually in the Bible, but uh, you know, it, it's a good symbol, symbolic representation of, of uh, the fact that uh, Jesus will enter someone's life when uh, they decide to open the door and let him in. He's not gonna barge in. So uh, the, mural, the mural section on the left of that I called patience, waiting, or temporarily being on hold, but alert. So everybody here is waiting. I mean, this is, more, this is the first one that I painted here, and it was the most obvious one. So I, I just decided to be there. And, it, and it, also, if you notice, this one is kind of dark in color, and this one is much lighter. You see the sunlight off of these people better, and it's a brighter color, set of colors. Um, but these are people, there's a man and his wife, I think she's keeping him back. He might, he might have walked a little faster without her, I'm not sure. But uh, he has to be, show patience to walk slowly for her. Um, these kids want to go across, but they're being obedient to their teacher, telling them to wait for the green light, I think. Um, there are people waiting for a bus back here. Uh, there's a man that's just sort of waiting to catch his breath. I think it was a hot day. And uh, there's, a, a, again, a family waiting for a bus or to go across the street or something. She's just waiting, I'm not sure why, just standing there waiting and, and looking 
and waiting. So that's all this was about. It was fairly simple. The next uh, window over is, again, I'm not sure it was in the Bible. I, actually, I think it was. With Je uh, at least a story about Jesus being with the little children and suffering the little children. Right. And, um, and so the panel to the left of that, <clears throat> uh, I call curiosity. And also uh, I was thinking of the words searching and attraction and moving towards some interesting person or event, uh, an, an awakening of interest, let's say. And so you'll see here, she's just curious about something, this woman in front. This man is just a curious person. He's an interesting looking guy. I'd like to go up and find out more about him. This, this child is curious about something and his mother is uh, you know, being solicitous. He, there's a whole group of people here that are turning around and looking. I don't know what it is behind them, but they're very curious about it. And they're, uh, so they're gathering together. Um, and uh, here's a little girl who can't contain herself. She's running off and the mother's trying to catch her. She's very curious. And these other young children, they're pulling dragon, pulling their mother along. Here's an older lady who's curious about something, stopping and looking at something over there. So it's about curiosity. And again, like I said, these, these are people exhibiting. They're on the streets just doing ordinary things, but they're exhibiting attitudes and, and emotions and states of mind that you that you might feel people uh, were feeling if they were in that particular biblical incident, although it's in a whole different way in the modern, modern era. Although this was in the 1970s, and I'm sure you're noticing some difference in clothing and all. <laughs> so it's not exactly yesterday <laughs> anymore, I'm afraid. Yeah, I was young then. <laughs> Look at me now. <laughs> the last. A window is my favorite window here, which is the transfiguration window with that wonderful flowing robes and mother of pearl, the Christ up there. I guess it's Elijah on, on the left and Moses on the right, I think. And uh, so uh, here we go uh, from that curiosity, the next, the next uh, of, of this mural panel, the next panel over seemed to be elation. Again, Jesus is with the little children over here. And so it's easy to move from that to the sense of elation and exhilaration. I also, yeah, I also called it gladness or exuberance or happiness or joy. A barely controlled exhilaration in some cases. Like this, this little girl, sometimes people wonder why she's there. She's trying to run and sip water at the same time. So that's not an easy thing to do. I don't know how successful she was, but uh, she wanted it, she wants to run but she's got this water, so she's trying to contain herself, but she's having trouble doing so. And there are other children. This, this girl has having even more trouble containing herself, I think. I, th I think her father just told her a joke, and she's probably young enough so the dad jokes still were funny. <laughs> so she might be laughing at this joke, I'm hoping. <laughs> my, my, my daughters are much too old for that. And, and uh, anyway, so these people are all smiling and being happy. There's a wind blowing through this girl's hair. They're, ju they're just being happy and turning, turning towards the window. This guy's almost dancing. I think this little kid is learning to walk and his, his friend is encouraging him on. He's very happy, this little boy. So anyway, that's, that's what that's about. And uh, that gets to the last mural section, which is what would you have between the transfiguration and then back to sound over here where the pipes are. Again, you're going back from the, I think visual art is a little more manifested form of art than music is. Music seems more abstract. So I think you're going from the visual back to the sound element. And uh, this, this panel is called dispersion. It's, and, and again, somebody asked me earlier today, uh, these front two panels, why they all look kind of bluish. There's more, if you notice in the back, I painted them at different times, so my sense of color changed, but there's, I think there are more oranges and reds back here. And, and the people are moving off in the distance here. Just like on the mural across the way, they're coming in from the distance. So they're con here they're congealing, where here they're dispersing. So once the resurrection has happened, after the uh, transfiguration window, people are 
saying goodbye to each other. Some people are looking back. They don't really want to look this way, even though they know this is the way they should be moving. The Euro cycle moves clockwise. Um, some are resisting that. See this boy, he's sort of holding, this other boy wants to go forward. He's sort of holding him back and saying, watch out, there must be some kind of risk. Um, and they're waiting, they're ready to go, they're not quite there. As you go to the right, people are moving faster and they're further apart. See the bike, the bicyclists, they're moving. And the walker, she's striding fast and they're moving more fast. But here they're just starting to think about breaking apart and moving, moving back to the, uh, uh, you know, undifferentiated kind of uh, energy before you start coming back on the cycle again on the right side. So in, in um, I guess in summary, I could say that uh, um, I was trying to get at a kind of coexistence between the inner reality of this being a sanctuary, religious sanctuary, and the outer ra reality on the streets. Just like the church itself is very uh, interested in both creating a great worship experience and serving the community at the same time. So this represents my attempt to, to bring the church outside and the outside into the church. Absolutely. Um, that was masterful, wasn't it? <laughs> Like the ability to even name what specific people were doing as to photograph. Uh, that was incredible. Um, can we have the mics brought to the middle of, of the aisle, Clint and Desmond, thank you. Uh, we're gonna open up the floor if there are any questions um, you know, for you all um, to, to, to ask Mr. Pressing. Um, I'll just uh, you know, throw this in. Um, as you were going around and naming each of the biblical scenes. Uh, by the way, that's Simon of Cyrene. That's um, the name that you were Thank you. for. It was kind of like a biblical pop quiz for me. As you know, <laughs> right, um, right, 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 right. I'm sorry right. to put you on the spot. No, 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 it's all good. And I don't have my phone, so I couldn't Google it. So, um, I Googled it. Right, okay, okay. Um, but, you know, what is, what is profound, um, you know, are the ways that these big theological ideas and themes these profound themes of life, you were able to capture in the ordinary, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, for, for a person like myself that didn't grow up with something called the liturgical calendar, I didn't know that what the period that we're in is called ordinary time. And one of the things I always talk about in Bible study is that ordinary time is when the most profound moments of life happen. Um, and you were able to capture that, I think, in a masterful way. So I just want to say thank, thank you. you. Thank you for um, saying that. So uh, the mics are uh, in uh, the middle <clears throat> of, of the aisle. And we just want to give folks an opportunity, if you don't mind, to, to, to talk to you. We have students uh, in the room, community members, uh, parishioners uh, who may have questions for you. So um, let's, let's have a Q&A with uh, Mr. Preston. And if you don't mind just saying your name um, as you ask your question. Sure. Um, yeah. Can you hear me? My name is Jonathan, and uh, first time I was here about 10 years ago. <coughs> you know, when I saw it, I thought to myself, well, this is what most of the 20th century missed in terms of church art. It's, it's what it's supposed to be about ordinary time, about the people. Mm -hmm. so I just I always adored it and, and, you know, absolutely blown away by it. Um, my question is, I'm a designer and artist, and so I've worked for years doing commercial and fine art pieces and stuff, but, you know, I didn't have a patron or a customer or a client or whatever, as much as they love your work, uh, there's always back and forth and all that kind of stuff. So I was always curious, how did you handle feedback? How did you get, you know, there were always, there would be responses to things that you proposed, and I was just sort of curious about what that back and forth was like. Because it looks to me like you practically did it with free hand, and mm -hmm. so I was always just wanted to know about that process. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question, I, and you're right, it was, I was almost given a, a perfectly free hand. One thing is, of course, I didn't do it, do it all in one weekend. It took me, uh, I think from beginning to end, it was three years. I, would, I did a few other projects in the middle, so I didn't spend all my time here, but uh, it took a long time. So I, I moved the scaffolding from one area to another, and of course, every time I moved it and exposed the part, I'd get a little feedback from people. And, and so as I was painting it, 
as part of the evolution of the work, and there is an evolution. I didn't, I mean, I sort of conceived it all at one time, but it changed as I painted it over that period of time. And, and part of that was informed by the, the, the people. As far as the minister and the, the session and the building committee were concerned, they were incredibly good to me, you know. They actually considered me an artist in residence. That was kind of an old fashioned Renaissance approach to a, a church's relationship with an artist. Although I think I had a better deal than Michelangelo had with Pope Julius. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, um, but uh, I did explain myself and every once in a while I'd get up and give a little talk about something in front of the congregation. So we had some feedback, but generally, and maybe I didn't hear all of the negative feedback. That's possible. But it, it was generally positive and I did try to keep it open um, dialogue going there. So it worked out. If I can just follow up on the Like I, like I said, this started out as an architectural project. We, we uh, um, did upgrades to mostly the chancel area. And then we realized we had to do something with the balcony walls at the same time. And gradually the idea of a mural came about during the architectural process. And when I said, when I said to myself, this could use a mural, <laughs> I, started, I started putting together a concept and I made some rough sketches. And, and, I, and I, I wrote out a draft, which I found recently, but my early pitch for, the, for doing a mural. And I presented that to the building committee. Mm -hmm. And they liked the idea, and they let me go ahead with the sketches. And then I came back with them and showed them more full-blown sketches. And they liked the idea a lot, so we went along with it. We went ahead with it at that time. So this is right when I was switching my architect's hat for my grungy beret. <laughs> <laughs> Well, obviously, it's a different set of technology now. Back at the time, I, I don't know if you took a look at the, I have a table out there where I have my original sketches. You can take a look afterwards if you want. All, all of these, I think I've got sketches for each. They're not my preliminary sketches, but the ones I finally developed before I painted. And, uh, and I also have photographs that I took out in the streets. And I also have the contact sheets. I don't know if you remember those, but when you take photographs with an old, film camera, SLR camera. I had, a, I had sheets of, uh, I think there were 36 shots, photographs, and I had, I had these, I w had my own darkroom set up. And I took these photographs, I went and developed the film, and I made contact sheets, and I looked at them with a, uh, you know, a magnifying glass. And I decided which ones I, looked interesting to me that might fit, that where I might be able to take the idea from that and put it into the mural. And, and then I, I went through a laborious process of, of blowing up a, a photograph and then looking at it and making sketches from it. Uh, today, I would do it a whole different way. You know, I can do it on the computer. I would, and I've done murals like that. And I've, I've scanned things in and, and I've, you can manipulate the size of images and fit them into larger um, um, compositions just all on the computer now. But back then, I couldn't. I just, I just did it all by hand with with tracing paper and with, with photographs. That's fascinating. I, my question may come out a little more of the of like the subject of the or when you know, we look at it now, any, any thoughts of what we do literally the same type of interaction? I wanted to go out and document what happened outside on the street, so that part would probably be the same. And I might, I might have a little more difficulty now. I, was, I had a camera 
that I kind of kept down here, and, and I and I set the distance on the camera lens, and I just sort of took a lot of photographs. I didn't even know what I was photographing, but if I could do that now, I would do it. But I know there are some privacy laws that might not have existed back then. Mm. And some people weren't happy when they knew I was photographing, but I was pretty good at keeping it uh, a secret. Mm. <laughs> and uh, I've. I think the, the kind of con the people are still do the same things on the streets. I know they have phones in their hands, so you would see pictures of people up here with phones in their hands. But people still interact. I was just looking at that. Susan, my wife, who's here, and I were walking before the service, and we walked around, and we went through Fort Greene Park and up and down the streets, and I, I, I saw people still doing some of the same things that were being done 40 years ago and probably 40 years before that. You know, the clothing is different, like I said. But, uh, and the, uh, certainly the phones are different, but not, you know what, not that different. And, and this, I know it's the 1970s, it seems like a long time ago, but it's not too long ago when you compare it to the Bible scenes that are on the windows. And so I was, uh, I was just thinking of what I was really trying to do when you were talking about time was uh, to erase time, you know, there, there's not that much difference when you, when you forget you take away the element of time and you just look at, right. at states of mind and attitudes and, and themes and uh, universal concepts, there, there is no time there. People are all the same. Cell phones are not. Yeah. Ed. Oh, Sorry. Uh, They cause any. Uh, yeah, You know, I, every once in a while, someone asked a question. They, not just about that, but other things. They said, "Did you mean to put that person there? You know, that person who was obviously a wino or, or sleeping on the ground, disheveled or." And I said, yeah, I did. And they said, okay. No, they, were, they were very nice. They're, you know, it, these aren't things you expect to see in a church. And, you know, it's, I wouldn't call this a shocking mural. I mean, it's, it's not, some murals are meant to be provocative. I don't, I don't see this as that way. I just want to reflect light, but I don't want to gloss it over either. So when I did that, people, people were with, that was, that was the last panel that I painted here. And people knew me enough by then so that they, uh, they knew it wouldn't make a difference if they didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> These are, these are based on real people that did what they did. And I think I still have a lot of those photographs I still have out here if you're interested. But I, di I did not take the helmets off when I painted them. <laughs> Okay, I'll try to remember your questions. <laughs> the first one is, in fact, we did remove Hughes. If I noticed in the back, in the vestibule, there are some um, drawings of the pew plan and with people's names on it because they rented pews. Families rented pews back in the 1890s, probably. That's when that was. And you'll notice that the pews come up 
pretty much up to here. Mm -hmm. they, like I said earlier, uh, there was enough room up here for the, for the communion table and a couple of chairs that the minister sat on and, uh, and the baptistry, I mean the sack, right. the fountain. Mm -hmm. right. And that was pretty much it. And that was on the side, actually. So there was very little room up here. You couldn't do things in the front of the church like you do now. And that was one of the parts of the um, architectural project before the murals got painted was to, to make this more open and adaptable and accessible so they could do different kinds of events up here. So, so that was actually was done. And of course, the pews up in the balcony were removed too, which wasn't my idea, but it was done because uh, I forget whether it was just Dr. Knight, but I think it was the, the members of the session. Dr. Knight was a pretty strong, strongly opinionated minister of those of you who knew him. Uh, and so often when he said something, uh, people tended to agree with him. But I, rem <laughs> I remember that uh, the pews up there, they were, they were nice pews. They looked just like these pews. Uh, but there were a lot of them and they were all empty. When I first was a member of the church, which was 10 years before you were, here was when I first came here. People still sat up there a little bit, but not, not very many of them. And looking up there, especially when there were smaller congregations, was kind of a disheartening experience. And so they felt psychologically it would be better just to remove the pews, which caused an acoustical problem. <laughs> we had to bring an acoustical engineer in to make up the difference. The, uh, the cushions on those pews helped uh, you know, do things with the sound and the space made it a little bit livelier than it was supposed to be. So we actually had put some other sound baffles up there that aren't there anymore, I noticed. We can talk about that later if you want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, we, we, we did take a lot of pews out of the church at the time. You'll have to repeat your second question. <laughs> so yeah, the tree of life concept. The tree of life concept, yeah. I, I think I went through a number of concepts early on and to tell the truth, I don't remember the details of the Tree of Life. I remember being interested in Kabbalism at the time. <laughs> and I remember um, the different branches of the Tree of Life. And maybe I was thinking that they could fit. I was trying to make sense of these windows in the early days. I did a lot of reading. Uh, the second minister of the church, Greg, when, when he was a minister, that's when all these windows were put in during that, I think it was about a 15 year period of time. And uh, when each window was finished, he'd have a special dedicatory service and he'd give a sermon on that window. So I was able, I don't think I saw them all, but I was able to read some of those old sermons to get a sense of, you know, what they felt about that window at the time they were put in. So um, I was trying to make sense of the windows and come up with concepts that would fit in the spaces between the windows. And that was one of the concepts, but it didn't go anywhere. <laughs> yeah. And then there was the question about whether all of the people in the mural are anonymous or whether you know anyone? I made a point not to, not to know the people that were in the mural. I, I recognized some of them, but I didn't want to get to know them. I didn't want to know their names. And, and I didn't want any of them to be members of the church. So they were supposed to be people that weren't, didn't go to this church, but lived in the community. So that was a rule I set up early on. There was only one person who, um, there's no question about who he is because he looks so different. It's the old gentleman I talked about who was selling all the patriotic thing. I found out a few years later who he was. I wrote his name down and everything. But everyone else, uh, I, don't, I don't know. If, some people tell me they, they recognize a the person and they know who it is, but um, I didn't really want to know. Okay. So we'll take these last three questions and we'll start with Carl. Hi, my name is Carl. I just wanted to know if there was a conscious decision to <laughs> animals. There were there were dogs. There were dogs out, and I don't have anybody in here. You're absolutely right. You should have been here 20 years ago. <laughs> 40 years. Excuse me. 40 years ago. Oh dear. You should have been here 40 years ago. I would have put some dogs in. Because now I don't know about this church, but in the church that we go to in Connecticut. They have a service where they bless the animals every year. <laughs> yeah, people bring their pets in, and actually there's some farms around there too, so sometimes you see more than pets coming into the church. <laughs> Church, beautiful urban, 
I did it when I was, I'm given my age now. I did it just before, I finished it just before I turned 30, or right around the same time that I turned 30 years old. And I was in the early part of my mural. I've had two careers. I was a mural painter, mostly a mural painter first. I did other kinds of artwork and I did some architecture work then. But then uh, um, maybe 10 years after we finished this, we moved up to Connecticut. And uh, then I became an architect primarily. I painted, again, I painted some murals after that, but mostly architecture work. So I find this in my early mid phase as an artist, you know, when I was concentrating my life work on, on, art, on artwork. I had done one other large mural that was kind of like this. It was filled, filled with people that I did um, um, the, a couple years before this one, I started it, and I finished it after this was beginning, because it, there was a it's a complicated story. There was a fire in the building, and I had to wait to finish it. But that got me it got me painting this kind of mural with, that I used to call people murals. I painted other kinds of murals where they were just geometric or abstract or or architectural kind of murals, Trump Lloyd murals. But these people murals, this was kind of the culmination of the, the people mural projects that I did. I'm just going to give uh, FYI, this is a question. Um, if you want to see what the sanctuary looks like, there are very similar ones at Plymouth Church, again in Brooklyn Heights, and you can either go online and look at the photos, the open celebrator, the chains go all the way up, right around, and all kind of lay around the front, this is the balcony as well, so that's very similar to what this architecture was. Secondly, I'm the one that took off that when I came here with us from Newton, it's better to have a live leader. Okay. Speaking, it's better to have a kid. So. But you're a, you're a musician, so, yeah. That is uh, our director of music. Very good. Very good. Um, Justin, good. you'll have the uh, last question. Um, hi. Can you partially answer what you said the people were intentionally out of the church? Or thinking about deacons? But I'm um, wondering. Do you remember anyone who was in the mural who came in and saw themselves in front of the action? And then my second question is, do you have a favorite or maybe five favorite characters? Mm. I never met somebody who recognized themselves. <clears throat> they came in here and said, that's, hey, that's me up there. You didn't get my permission. Uh, I did run across people who were positive that the person up there was their, their aunt who had just died or something like that. And um, sometimes they even showed me photographs of them, and, and they look kind of like them. I, I must tell you that these are based on photographs, but I, I changed them a bit. <laughs> so they're not exactly the people that are in the photograph. I wanted to bring out certain qualities, certain, as I said, emotions or states of mind that the people um, had, that I, that I thought the people had, but I wanted them to enha be enhanced. So I might have changed the way people actually looked. They weren't meant to be perfect portraits of people. So um, I didn't get that too much, but I did get people who were sure that they knew the person that was painted. Um, and the, for, as far as the num a few people that, that are, are favorites for me, um, I don't know why, but um, each, each panel has one or two favorites, and that's, so I don't know if you want to go into all that. But I remember, especially when I was getting towards the larger ones, I remember, like, like especially when I hit that, that one in the corner, it called anxiety. You know, I had a couple of favorites in there. The, the woman that's just above the door with the yellow and black dress, she was a favorite for some reason. And, uh, and the gentleman coming down, even the gentleman coming down, uh, off the off the bus, you know. So those two were kind of favorites. Over here, I, I spent so much time doing him that he became a favorite just because there's so much detail on him. Um, and uh, I don't know. Sometimes the people, when I painted them, I knew when to stop painting because they, they spooked me out. They started looking back at me. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, that, I think they were my favorites at the time, but I tried to block them. <laughs> Um, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, we, we commented on, Kevin and I, as we walked through 
the mural was that uh, you had never signed it <laughs> until today. Yeah. Do you want to just point out to the folks? Uh, where uh, the yes, up there is? down there. I don't know if you can see it, but it's, there was a big space there underneath uh, that I don't, I don't think they had anywhere else. So I just put it. I, I fudged the date. I know I did it today, but. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we finally got to sign it. So, Mr. Preston, any final words? I, know, I appreciate uh, you putting this together. I, I, like I said to you earlier, I feel a little, a little bit uncomfortable with being at the center of attention. It's been a long time for me. Because I've had, I moved on and did different things. I obviously moved away from Brooklyn. And uh, it, I loved the life I had here, but we had a very different life later. So it's, it's quite a... Uh, event for me to come back here and to be part of this again and thank you for being so open with me and uh, and I, I know this mural is an important part of your life and I'm grateful for that and I'm glad that you uh, wanted to have me here to, to, to help you understand a little bit better so thank you thank you thank you, thank you. you know that um, this uh, video will be archived and will um, live with prep for a bit and that um, our incredible videographer is making sure that it'll be available and as soon as it is we'll put it on the church's website um, and of course it'll be available on Pratt's website. Mr. Pressing has been generous with his time and will um, hang out for a little bit in our lecture hall so if you want to come by shake his hand see some of those sketches and polar warriors you're more than welcome to um, and um, as the pastor of this church, we need to let you know that we are in what's called stewardship season. Um, that is when we are putting together our resources to make sure that we continue to be good stewards of this building, um, of this artwork, but also the social justice initiatives of this church. You can check out our website, lapcbrooklyn.org, and right at the top of the page is a donate button. We invite you. Uh, to uh, be generous and give whatever you're able to so that we can continue to put on events like this and also continue the great work of this church. Uh, thank you to all of you who made this afternoon possible. Can you give yourselves a round of applause? Thank you again to Deb. Thank you again to the Stewardship Committee. Thank you to Pratt. Everyone have a great afternoon. Thank you.